Um, firstly, let me just introduce myself. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Vicky Holgate. Um, I work at Diageo. Um, I'm also the new chair of the APG. Um, so I'm delighted to be introducing this evening. Um, as my sort of little hello piece on the website, which some of you may have read, um, I talked a little bit about what I think makes for a fulfilling career um, as a strategist um, in advertising. Um, and that's being brilliant being happy and also feeling respected for the value that we add to our clients' businesses every day. Um, and tonight's um, event is very much on that first pillar of being brilliant. Um, I'm hoping that we'll all go home today um, with a few more ideas of different ways that we can think and be a little bit more brilliant in our day-to-day -day jobs. Um, I'm really delighted that we have um, Adam Morgan come to speak to us this evening. Um, I feel like it's a little bit of a coup. Actually, Adam spoke at our first ever Noisy Thinking, so it's really it's fantastic that he's come back to do another one for us. Um, he has been collaborating with PhD um, on a new book, which you may or may not have seen, um, Overthrow 2. If you haven't read it, I can thoroughly recommend it. Um, Working my way through it, actually, I, I found it there was a real energy in the examples that there are within this book, um, and also some really fresh thinking about um, how we might approach the brand problems that, that we face. Um, Adam um, defines a, a challenger brand um, as, as being about a state of mind rather than actually the, the, the size of the brand itself. And hopefully today, um, whether we work on a startup or whether we actually find ourselves working on legacy brands, we'll all be able to take away something, um, a way of thinking, a little bit of that mindset um, that will help us in our day-to-day -day jobs um, from tomorrow morning. So I'm going to hand over to Adam. Welcome, Adam. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to Vicky and Sarah and the APG and to Google. Um, I'd just like to say the disco music has nothing to do with me, um, um, but I love it. So um, we, perhaps we can all take to that afterwards after a few beers. I got interested in challenges, I suppose, because I'd, I'd started my life as the worst account manager in the history of account management and then switched into planning as a kind of refuge uh, at what was then BMP. And um, I found myself always working on... With cre in creative agencies with a strong planning input that always therefore seemed to pick up the number two or three brand. We never got market leaders for some kind of reason. Um, and increasingly, it, I became interested in the fact that when you sat down with a client to look at their this year's plan, the AOP, consciously or unconsciously, we were all filling in this grid. Um, and if you've never seen it before, perhaps that's because it's more unconscious than conscious, but that's what we all do. There are two dimensions to this grid, obviously. One is uh, to do with the category. Are we this year going to progress the category or maintain the category? And secondly, are we going to progress the brand or maintain the brand? And most of us and most of my clients, consciously or unconsciously, were in the bottom left. They essentially were looking for, I don't know, 3 or 4% brand share increase, not looking to do an enormous amount in terms of progressing the category because the category was treating them quite nicely. And, and that's kind of where they sat. And they were effectively, whether they called themselves or that or not, incumbents. But equally, if you work in a creative agency, one of the things that you tend to get is people who need to do more with less, obviously. And if you work in a planning agency, they're looking for a sort of strategic insight and a strategy that's going to allow them to do more with less and lead to that creative breakthrough. And by and large, you can't get to that by sitting in that bottom left-hand corner. You have to do something that is going to change the conversation in the category in your favor and, and, and kind of change the criteria of choice in your favor. So I was really interested in what it meant to live in that top right-hand side. And it became increasingly obvious that merely uh, doing a different ad um, as a challenger was not going to be the totality of what it meant to live in that place. So I took six months out. I researched and wrote a book called Eating the Big Fish that actually coined the concept of challengers. And I've been living in this world ever since. And this book represents, I suppose, a taking stock of 20 years of studying and researching and looking at challengers. And I must have interviewed, I guess, about 300 of them by now. What's changed and what's stayed the same? And what does it mean for us as practitioners? Because I, like you, am a practitioner. I'd love to say there's money in writing books. Any of you who think there is, I'd like to disabuse you of that notion. <laughs> there isn't. Um, but it is a fantastically stimulating way to get to some really interesting people. So if you were interested in the book, it's worth reading just for the interviews. Talk to some fascinating, fascinating people in there, some of whom I'll talk about now. Now, the thing about challenges is, you know, when you, when you write a book or when you start off, you know, kind of with a concept like that, you hope it's going to last you five or ten years. And the interesting thing about challenges is it waxed and wanes slightly as a concept. Started off very strongly, got replaced for a while by the whole not notion of startups. The whole notion of startup culture kind of replaced challenge in that top right-hand side. 
then the bloom was off the rose, really, of the sort of whole Silicon Valley kind of startup scene, uh, and disruption came in for a while. Uh, and now it's back again, and I'm interested in why it's back, and I'm going to talk about what's helpful about why it's back and what isn't helpful about why it's back uh, to talk about um, how we apply it. So clearly, there are lots of people describing themselves, rightly or wrongly, as challengers, uh, and there are lots of people uh, talking about what it means to be a challenger. Um, if you look at, uh, on the right-hand side there, so there's now a, a challenger brand conference in the States set up by Adweek Brand Week, um, and what's interesting about it is A, that it exists, B, that um, they say challenger brands are here to stay, and C, the level of superficiality with which they talk about what a challenger is. Uh, ch you get the impression from reading about it that challenger is a digital first D to C brand effectively. And as I'll go on to talk about, one of the things I think it is part of our job as planners and strategists to do is to reintroduce nuance into strategy. A strategy and the conversation about strategy seems to have become terribly binary, and I think Twitter has partly you know, uh, accelerated that, but we need to introduce more um, depth and substance and nuance into the way that we discuss strategy and particular challenges. A more substantive piece of work, and a more interesting piece of work was done by BCG um, in actually 2017, this is the, the wrong slide for this, um, where they looked at IRI data for the last five years between 2012 and 2017, uh, what happened to packaged goods and the shift from big to small in packaged goods and uh, identified that $22 billion worth of value had shifted from big to small in the US alone in that five-year period and the same amount had shifted in Europe. Uh, that was then followed by a McKinsey study looking at why retailers were so interested in challenges in packaged goods and this chart really speaks to that. What it says is even though you look at when you look at challenges, smaller brands, a relatively small proportion of the share, they account for a disproportionately large amount of the growth. And that's the reason why, Ch why Sainsbury's, for instance, has a whole future brand section and a future brands aisle, because A, they're looking to differentiate themselves with customers, and B, also, they want to be right at the heart of where that growth is going to come. So this notion of challenges and interest in challenges has resurfaced. Categories that, frankly, you would have said were sort of perhaps the dullest categories of the work in, i.e. packaged goods, 10 years ago have completely come back. There's a really interesting sea change going on. So is that an interesting blip, or is that something more permanent? And one of the things the book looks at is why actually it's going to be a more permanent change. And I'll talk later on about why we interviewed VCs in particular, and their very commercial perspective on why they're interested in challenges and why they think it's here to stay. So I'm going to talk about three things tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk about what's changed about challenges in 20 years and what's still true. Just kind of a brief snapshot. I'm going to talk about the challenger narrative model that the kind of collaboration with PhD looks at and a brief illustration of how to use it and direct you, if you're interested in using it more, at um, uh, just a, a piece that will help you do that. And then um, Sarah and Vicky asked me to talk about applying the challenger strategy and the challenger mindset to legacy brands. Uh, and how you do that without going completely mad. So uh, I, you know, the way I derive income, as I say, is not from writing books, it's from working with clients. Actually, the way we make our money is not by working with lots of small challenges. They don't have enough uh, of those or they don't have enough money to give us. I spend my time working with large legacy clients who want to apply more of that challenger mindset. So I'm like a lot of you in this room. What have I learned from 20 years of doing that that perhaps you can take away and apply yourselves? So that's the third part of the conversation. Can everyone hear me? Does my, yeah, okay, good. Um, and if you're interested and want to follow up, I can't resist just directing you to thechallengerproject.com, which is just a sharing of a lot of the interviews in the book. You can see the people that we interviewed in the book talking more personally if you're interested and stimulated by what they've got to say. Um, so first of all, what's changed in 20 years and what stays the same? So some things haven't changed, and none of this is going to make you fall off your chair. I'm just struck when I look at the marketing around me and the clients around me about how little they lean into any of these things, really. So first of all, challengers challenge, right? They challenge something. They challenge something about the codes of the category or the codes of the culture. And the reason that they do that is because they want to change the criteria for choice in the category in their favor. So far, so very obvious. But again, striking how little one sees that happening in the world around you. Uh, third, they recognize you have to amplify your differences. I had a client a couple of years ago who came out with this fabulous soundbite, which is if you don't have a 10x product, you need a 10x point of view. And again, that's, that's something we spend a lot of our time working with clients on, um, not getting just to a 2x point of view, but a 10x point of view. How do you really dial that up and use everything to communicate that? Uh, because everything does communicate. Uh, strategies about making choices, as we know. So how do you help um, a client get 
uh, confident in really sacrificing over committing. That's probably the hardest part of the job and the work uh, that we do. And finally, the strategic imperative of drama. Uh, it's always been important for um, a challenger. You need to get people to notice you even if they're not looking for you. Um, and I was actually talking with Vicky and Sarah earlier on about in how in a world of continuous partial attention, the use of drama, the strategic use of drama, which used to be a, let's leave that to the art director to decide whether we're going to use that or not, I think it's genuinely become a strategic question rather than a creative question. There was a fascinating uh, interview with Nicola Roberts from Girl Aloud in The Guardian the other day, you might have seen it, where she talks about her first stage role and how different it is from being on screen. She says, when, when you're on screen, she says, you know, the camera picks up all the subtleties of what you're doing. But her, her coach on stage says, there is no room for subtlety on stage. You have to make big definitive gestures that are gonna be seen right at the back of the gallery at the top. And challenges really live on stage rather than live on TV from that point of view. So some things haven't changed, but some things clearly have changed. And a lot of what's changed is causing big brands to behave in a different way and investors to behave in a different kind of way. So for instance, velocity. Look at Halo Top. Halo Top went from nowhere to the um, market leading tub of ice cream in the US in five years. Chobani went from effectively nowhere to 20% share of the yogurt market in 10 years. Uh, somebody was telling me yesterday that one of the big four banks put on 22,000 customers in the last quarter. Monzo put on 27,000 customers in the last quarter. So one of the things that's changed is that 10, 15, 20 years ago, you had quite a lot of time as an incumbent to watch what was happening in that top right-hand corner, to watch what was happening as that challenger, and just kind of see if it's going to take off and is it really going to affect us. What's happening is, first of all, you're getting depositioned by that challenger much more quickly. And secondly, they're starting to eat your lunch much more quickly. And that's spooking big legacy brands. You may be working on large legacy brands that are spooked by that, by the depositioning and by the share loss. First key change. Second key change is the quantity of challenges. It used to be very simple. In any market, there was roughly an incumbent and a big establishment brand and an obvious challenger. That is not so much the case anymore. There are loads of challenges, pretty well invested, um, all got slightly different points of view, all got slightly different business models. It's hard to pick out who is the definitive challenger in any particular category at the moment. And that, again, is, is because of the number of investors betting on challenges, as I say. Uh, the third is size. Um, so I never seriously expected 20 years ago that a um, big four bank would ever come and say, we'd like to adopt more of a challenger mindset. Come and work with us, eat big fish. That's exactly what we're doing at the moment. And, and it's for all those reasons I talked about, which is they see the challenges coming. They recognize that they need to adopt more of a challenger mindset. And, and different incumbents are responding in different ways with different degrees of success. So some of you may have seen that last year in March, the CTO of Qantas in Australia said, look, I'm completely freaked out. We are all at Qantas completely freaked out by what's happening in the automotive business. The change precipitated by the combination of Uber and Tesla and autonomous vehicles and all that kind of trend is, is changing the automotive market so quickly, we in the airline business need to be able to respond much quicker. And if we wait for those challenges to emerge and declare themselves, it will almost be too late. We need to create a version of Qantas that sits in the top right-hand corner that is the most dangerous, digital-first, challenger to ourselves we can imagine and work out what we're going to do to, to either create that or combat that. He said that in March 2019, he'd left by the summer and gone to Vodafone. <laughs> so Qantas is less successful, perhaps, in addressing this issue. Conversely, conversely, let's turn our attention to Oregon. This is Tillamook. Some of you may know this case history. It's a fantastic story. Tillamook is a 100-year-old dairy cooperative. They have 90 different dairy farmers collectively pooling their money to do the collective kind of marketing and advertising budget. Uh, they'd been tootling along sort of fairly static for about 10 years, up to 2012. They appoint a new uh, CEO who doesn't come from the category and says, I want to adopt more of a challenger mindset. He doesn't sadly employ big fish, but nevertheless, he goes ahead, he plays a very good agency, 72 and Sunny, says, I want to adopt more of a challenger mindset, let's start. They start relatively cautiously, but what they do do is they say, well, look, we need to recognize that we, we need something to rub up against. We're not going to go after craft cheese slices explicitly, but God, do we loathe everything that they stand for. Apologies to anybody craft in this room. They're not even technically cheese. It's pretty close to plastic, really. Um, 
but we're not going to go directly against them. But we are going to talk about the fact that actually there's got to be some standards in this bloody industry, and we do it right, and not everybody does do it right. So we will amplify our differences. That's the first thing we'll do. We'll put a line in the sand and say we are dairy done right, and not everybody does that. And we'll talk about that. You know, we'll do individual executions. And by the way, we're a cooperative. Let's make some more of that. And the campaign goes pretty well, and they kind of like it, so they get a bit more confidence, and they think, OK, actually, let's go after this in a more interesting way. So we won't go after an enemy. We'll create a monster. The difference, as you all know, I'm sure, in narrative is that an enemy is a threat just to me, but a monster is a threat to my entire community. If I go up against a, mon a monster, I'm acting on your behalf, and if I win, we all win. So they created a monster, and the monster was big food, it already exists, they can tap into that. And the antithesis is real food. So, big food, real food. And they did this ad. Hey, big food. We've had some good times. You were so colorful, so sweet. But I've had enough of your artificial ingredients. Enough quantity over quality. I'm done. Goodbye, big food. Hello, farmers. Hello, co-op. Hello, integrity. Hello, Molly. Hello, naturally aged cheddar made by a real craftsman. Hello, Dale. Hi. Hello, better lunch boxes, better breakfasts, better snack times, better Sunday family dinners. Hello, people who care about their food and how it's made. Hello, everyone. We found something real. Tillamook. They did the ad. Uh, they reorganized their kind of portfolio slightly to get rid of some of the stuff that didn't fit it. Bear in mind, this is a 100-year-old company, right? In five years, uh, they increased revenue by 70%, uh, and they increased profits by 300%. So what I like about this as an example is it blows up, you know, we talked about blowing up, it blows up quite a lot of myths, I think, about challengers. It blows up the myth that challengers are young, hip brands with maverick founders. Well, some are and some aren't. Let's get some nuance back into this conversation. It blows up the myth that you can't be a challenger if you're run by a committee. I get this all the time in workshops, usually from the creative director. Oh, well, there's no point in us trying to do this, you know, because we don't have a founder. Absolutely not the case. There are actually loads of examples of legacy brands without founders that have strong leadership, admittedly, but don't have founders who've done very brave and very innovative uh, challenger strategies and executions. Uh, the other thing I like about this is the notion of you're either brave or you're not. Um, they were certainly prepared to have a go, but that first campaign is quite brave, but they found their confidence along that journey. They found it over a four-year period. And part of the thing, I think, that that agency did so brilliantly is it helped them find their confidence. And part of, I think, our job as strategists is to help clients go on journeys where they find their confidence to do things that otherwise they didn't think they were going to do. Um, and finally, it, I think it blows up the idea that challenge and disruption are pretty much the same thing. I think it's a really good example that there's no disruptive business model in there. There's no disruptive product in there. There's an awful lot of challenge in there completely transform the status and the profits of that business. And incidentally, if that's a 100-year-old business, let's just briefly look at Oatly uh, in the spirit of nuance. At one level, Oatly is a really, because we're still staying in sort of, sort of dairy, plant-based dairy, you know what I mean, milks, anyway, milks. Um, at one level, Oatly, which is one of the kind of key interviews in the book, is an incredibly modern business, isn't it? It's right at the heart, it's a product, right at the heart of a of uh, the plant-based trend. Uh, it's funded by a family-owned VC, patient family money is what they call it, patient family investment. Um, and the internal model, they've blown up the marketing department. What they have is a creative director working directly to the CEO in a business model or an internal model that's much more like a fashion business effectively. So very modern at one level. On the other hand, extraordinarily conventional, entirely unremarkable packaging structure. It's in packaged goods and they love a much very conventional media mix. They love outdoors. This is not a digital first brand. So it's an example of a very old brand that's blowing up those myths about challenges and a very new brand that's blowing up those myths about challenges. So I think we just need to kind of uh, reawaken, I suppose, a more rounded understanding of what a challenger is for us and for our clients. So just continuing with what's changed, um, one of the uh, 
kind of uh, bits of kerosene on the fire of challenges is the level of investment interest. Uh, so we went off to speak actually to two VCs, one of which is called The Craftery, which set up in the UK a couple of years ago. They've got 300 million behind them, uh, set up again by two kind of families. Uh, and then Verl Invest, who are based in Belgium, which actually is the um, InBev family. So the InBev family in mid 90s worked out that um, effectively, you know, they, they effectively wanted to look at other kinds of investment other than beer, um, kind of for the future. They've now got 1.6 billion euros um, of kind of brands under management. Um, they range from packaged goods up to um, uh, ed tech um, and health. Uh, and both of them characterize themselves primarily as working in challenges. The Craftery is entirely in challenges and Verl Invest is about 75% of themselves in challenges. And they talk a little bit about um, what they think is ch why they're interested in challenges, and they talk about how the a lot of the barriers to challenger growth and challenger profitability have dramatically reduced. Uh, you know, you don't have to scale, for instance, to be profitable anymore because you can outsource everything. But they also talk about um, what they're looking for to invest in a challenger, and I thought this was a really interesting question for us. So these are pure commercial people uh, making judgments about brands that they think they can grow three, four, five times. There's absolutely no sentimentality involved in this at all. Um, what are the things they are looking for from a challenger that are their key criteria? And I, I mentioned them partly because I was very stimulated by it, um, and you might be, and partly because actually there's more in the book about that if you're interested. And it might maybe just be pertinent to us too. So bear in mind, they are looking at quite small emergent challenges. Um, and most of these are primarily packaged goods, admittedly. But I think the criteria for choice are kind of interesting. So the first is, they're looking for consumer passion. So uh, they have, Verl Investor, developed two kind of social media tools which allow them to assess for a small brand. And they, so Verl Invest own Oatly, Vita Coco, they own Sir Kensington before they sold it to Unilever, uh, and a couple of others I'm completely blanking on. So brands that we kind of know and would respect and have grown considerably. Um, so consumer passion, the fact that people are talking about it, um, the fact that it has a kind of an energy and a buzz in the conversation, that is their first criteria for choice. That's kind of interesting. Second one, I think even more interesting, buying behavior. They are looking for brands that have a disproportionately high degree of loyalty. And so spoke to the, the guy in charge, who's a very senior and experienced marketer, Eric Melwell, who's worked in lots of big brands, including AB. And I said, well, this is quite striking, isn't it? Because everything we're taught in terms of the evidence is that there isn't actually as much brand loyalty, if any brand loyalty, as we think. And he said, I understand that may not be true of mainstream brands, but what I'm seeing at brands in these early stages is that there is. What we saw for Oakley in the early days was if a store didn't stock Oakley, people would drive another five miles to go and get it. That's the kind of thing I'm looking for, that kind of deep loyalty, not because something is cool, but because they've created an actual relationship with that brand for some reason. That's what I'm looking to invest in. Hmm. OK, that's interesting. Uh, brand management, obviously, I am looking for a group of two to three people uh, who clearly have talent, who clearly work well together. I'm looking for at least one of them to be from outside the category. I want some intelligent naivety in that group. That's going to be very important to sustaining the momentum. Fourth, I want a superior product, yes, but I also want evidence that they can maintain the superiority of that product. They can keep kind of improving it as they go along. So some R&D capability in that kind of way. And fifth, I want a brand that has a mission at its heart. So we had a long conversation about purpose at this point. So what you do realize, again, purpose has become a very kind of controversial thing. Some people think it's absolutely wonderful and a be all and end all. And some people think it's a load of shit. So clearly, that's not your position. You think it's the first of those. And you say, what I see in a mission is three things that I find very valuable. First is, there's a much higher inclination to take the right degree and the right nature of risk if you're very clear on what your mission is. Second, he said, I see it as uh, a way of recruiting talent. And clearly, if you're one of those smaller, younger companies, you want them to be talent magnets. And third is, he said, I see a much greater degree of resilience when the going gets tough. If you've got this mission at your heart for these young brands with these groups of people, you get a much higher degree of resilience coming out of that. Now, listen, of course, we're not talking about legacy brands here. We're talking about small brands with these small groups of people. <coughs> Nevertheless, I think some of those things are really interesting in there, and we should pay attention to them. And we should understand, perhaps, as strategists, how purely commercial people think about investing their time and energy and money uh, in some of these kinds of brands. This is a guy called Ernie, who's one of the co-founders of The Craftery. 
um, merely expressing his excitement, his incredible excitement, uh, about what he sees happening. One of the points he makes is that um, you're going to see a lot more level of investment in challenges, um, and particularly non-tech challenges. Why? Because the markets have raised uh, three times as uh, the amount of money uh, since 2014 as they did beforehand, but the amount of money flowing into tech has decreased by 40%. So there's a wash of money around. It's not flowing into tech as much as it was. It's going to go into new challenges in a wide variety of different categories. They're suddenly going to find themselves resourced and backed, you know, because they'll have senior kind of help and ex expertise behind them in a way they haven't been before. So Ernie's point is, this is not going to stop anytime soon. This is a wind at the back of a movement of a new generation of challenges, which is going to continue. It's not to say that Every challenger, of course, in every category is going to succeed. You'd have to be quite a brave challenger, uh, quite, a, quite a brave investor to bet on a new challenger in search, for instance. You know. but, uh, but in a lot of categories, you are. Uh, and you're going to see that, and it's going to come through. And that's what we're seeing with the velocity and the size and the quantity thing. The other thing that's changed, which is the second, leads me to the second part of the speech, is about narrative. Um, and this big shift, I think, in challenges between challenging somebody to challenging something. So the, the book is a collaboration, um, as Vicky was saying, between uh, ourselves and PhD, um, looking at both the kind of strategic and the media strategy side uh, of a number of different narratives and saying that if it's not about David Goliath, what is it about? And if you take the view that actually it's about challenging something rather than somebody, it says if you look at the most successful challenges of the last 10 years, there seem to be 10 different narratives uh, that most of them adopt. And each of these has at its heart something that they're challenging. So the irreverent maverick, for instance, is, is sort of poking beige in the eye. Effectively, it's saying, you know, I'm, I'm challenging the, the boring sameness of the category. Think of Brewdog, for instance. I'm challenging the boring sameness of the category. I want to inject some kind of fun and some energy into this in some kind of way. Um, the missionary, you'll, you'll kind of recognize which sense these are. I'm a brand kind of on a mission to kind of change a fundamental code or, or convention of this category because I think it's pernicious in some way or unhelpful. Or, uh, um, uh, next generation is saying, well, look, essentially, I'm challenging the relevance of the past to the present. That was then and this is now. So Oatly and the Oatly being for the post-milk generation says, there was a time when we needed cows to produce protein because it was a cheap and effective form of producing protein. That time is gone. You know, cows are not good for us anymore. Actually, we don't need that kind of milk anymore. That was then, this is now, this is next generation milk, effectively. Uh, democratizers obviously ch um, challenge why things should be so expensive, uh, uh, or indeed why things should be accessible only to a few people. Uh, why can't we lower the barriers to make them accessible to a broader group of people? People's champions actually challenge the motives of the establishment. Listen, these are fat cats that have been lining their pockets at your expense for far too long. We are going to stand up and change this for you because, in the spirit of the monster, if we win, you will win. So 10 different narratives, uh, again, which the book lays out. I won't go through them all. Um, but each of them has an interview, which I think is really stimulating and interesting, um, uh, regardless of kind of what's in the rest of the book. Fascinating interview with Copa 90, for instance, about um, giving uh, football, in particular, back to the fans uh, and why you actually don't need sports rights to set up a sports channel. Almost unthinkable 10 years ago. Surely if you set up a sports medium, you need sports rights of some kind. No, we don't. We just need a different perspective and to challenge something about the fundamental way in which people and, and big business, big football, um, owns and tries to kind of, uh, kind of corrupt the way that you interact with football these days. So having set up these kind of 10 different narratives, the question uh, perhaps in our minds is, so what do I do with this exactly? How is this useful to me? So I'm just going to offer a couple of thoughts about how it might be useful uh, as we go forward, and indeed how we're kind of using it. So the first is, if you've got a client that is interested in exploring challenger thinking, or you think ought to be interested in exploring challenger thinking, it's actually really useful and really productive to pick three or four of these narratives and say, look, we're not going to commit to any of these narratives at the moment. We're just going to explore what it would mean to look at your brand through each of these four lenses. If you were to... Uh, take the value that you represent and wrap a democratizer narrative around it, for instance, where would that take you? How would we behave? How would we speak? Who would we speak to? Who would we not speak to? If you were to take um, much more of a kind of next generation narrative around this, you know, what would that mean about 
who we'd want to leave behind, who, what our competitive set might be, your brand neighbourhood might completely change according to the narrative that you actually use. So let's look at a couple of examples. So let's take just four of these narratives. So Enlightened Zaga. So Enlightened Zaga is challenging the boring and the beige. Um, our example in the book is Brewdog. Uh, sorry, Irreverent Maverick is challenging the boring and the beige. Uh, example in the book is Brewdog. Enlightened Zaga is challenging a prevailing societal trend or attitude. This is a furniture brand called Vitsu, started by Dieter Rams. That's all essentially about longevity. So it's effectively challenging the disposable, disposability. You know, everything that IKEA represents in many ways, it's challenging saying, no, just buy a few things, buy them really well made and really designed, well designed, and hang on to them. Um, Local hero is really sort of challenging faceless globalization, um, an increasingly common narrative, actually, uh, particularly outside the UK, but you see it here as well. The next generation I talked about, challenging the relevance of the past to the present. So um, let's take, for example, uh, the co-op. So the co-op, I think, is doing fantastic advertising at the moment. It's a really good positioning. I don't want anybody in the room who's working on co-op to be, think I'm being critical. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the co-op. I've done a lot of work with the co-op, though not involved in the strategy. I think it's great. But let's imagine, just for the sake of argument, because it's a brand we understand, and has a very particular set of values, right? It's, it was born, whatever it was, 150 years ago. has a very particular business model where it gives all its profits back to its members. has a very clear set of values. It's not going to change the business model. It's not going to change the values. So the narrative's job is not to change those things. The narrative's job is to express those in a fresh and a new way that's going to be interesting and renew that kind of interest to a whole new group of customers. So um, you might say, right, you'll sit down with the cop and you'd say, let's explore these four narratives. And I know that not all of these will be right. So for instance, I know that you'll be uncomfortable living here all the time and solely all the time. But there's something about the need to shake up um, the kind of hold that the big supermarkets and indeed perhaps a new generation of discounters have got on the collective imagination that perhaps we ought to be a bit more um, punchy about. Perhaps we just need to shake Britain's lapels in a slightly more uh, punchy way. So let's look at what it would mean to explore that as a challenger narrative. Let's also um, look at, you know, um, leaning into the fact that we are an enlightened Zaga. Uh, we are actually uh, somebody who is not taking our money and giving it all to institutional investors in uh, London. We are actually returning that money to the members who buy and spend all their, their money in, in the co-op. You know, so, so that's surely a better way to work, isn't it? I know the business and commercial world is going that way, but surely we need to go that way in the future. More specifically, perhaps, we're actually returning it to the local communities. And we all know that London doesn't really care about anywhere else apart from London. So if we really want to rebuild local communities and the rest of Britain, surely the co-op's got to be right at the heart of that. Now, the interesting thing here is that some of these seem much less suited to this kind of work. So you might say, well, next generation, but this is 150 years old, right? And this is a very old business model, and people think of the co-op as being very old-fashioned. How could you possibly apply a next generation kind of lens to this? I'm going to show you an ad uh, from Norway, actually, for co-op in Norway, uh, which does it, and I think does it brilliantly, and completely reframes the whole way you think about co-ops. Uh, here we go. I mean, we can't just give up on this idea. I mean, think about it. We're the first startup to combine sharing economy and everyday shopping. Exactly. We have to make this happen. Chain of stores, calling by the people, sharing a profit. Oh, is that like an app? No. no stores. stores. Come on, you guys. All we need is a new investor, and we can get it started up again, right? Yeah, where are we going to find that kind of money? <laughs> Not around here, that's for sure. It's OK. That's OK. Just, just think. Like, what, um, what's the richest country in the world? That would be Norway. Sorry, stick shit. So this is the richest country in the world. It totally is. And actually, the crazy part is that uh, most of the billionaires here made their money by selling groceries. I think the richest one lives in like Trondheim or something. It should be close by. It's a seven and a half hour drive. Hey guys, the presentation looks amazing. And we're actually here. We're doing this in North. Wait. It's okay. That's okay, don't worry about it. It's just a coincidence, it just happens to say something familiar to us. It's just a sign in the middle of nowhere. That's a real store. Yeah. 
Coop right there? Hey, hey, we want to know who's the owner. Who? Where's who's the owner? The owner? Uh, well, it's him. What? And uh, her and then those guys. And those guys? Everyone can be an owner. Sorry, come again? We are 1.6 million owners. That's uh, what makes it a co-op. <laughs> they totally stole our idea. Can't be happy. That's brilliant, isn't it? What a fantastic strategic flip that is. Um, I absolutely love it. So, so the point is that even some of these territories, which you think are, surely that's not really going to work, actually, if you lean into them, they offer a great opportunity to explore, to safely explore um, different strategic options with a client who might be cautious. I love the, the report that Google published, which I'm sure you've read uh, about three years ago where they looked at um, you know, the most successful small teams within Google and the five things that had made those successful small teams so successful. And the most important of all of those factors by far was psychological safety. Uh, and it's so true, right? You know, we, we perform at our best when we feel psychologically safe. I think one of the things that this model helps do is create a sense of psychological safety with a big brand owner that you're not necessarily committing to anything yet. We're just exploring stuff together and you're taking them on a journey. Um, just a second example of what you can do, I think, is to say, let's take a, a, an important uh, part of a brand. It's not the whole of the brand, it's a part of the brand. We've got a value message that we need to communicate. Um, how could we use this as a lens to communicate value in a more interesting way? Well, I think that um, you know, if you were looking at through a people's champion lens, you'd say, well, look, you know, this market has been way too expensive for too, for too long because those people have been absolutely reaming us. Uh, and we are actually going to offer a much more cost-effective option for you because, frankly, nobody should be paying that much for that stuff anymore. Uh, Enlightened Zaga says, you know, I know the world thinks that actually you should be spending this much money on this stuff. Actually, we think you've got other priorities. So, you know, let's introduce a cheaper, more effective model. Democratizer obviously is about saying, you know, the, the, this is stuff is so important and so good. It just shouldn't be left to the, this lot to enjoy. We should all be able to enjoy it. Uh, and next generation so might say, um, look, there was a time when this stuff had to be expensive. It doesn't have to be that expensive anymore. We found a different way of making it a different kind of value. So I'm moving through this quite quickly, but you can kind of see how these lenses help you look at qualities and characters and types of um, message that you need to land and just explore different ways to make them fresh and interesting. Uh, and again, if you're interested, um, on the site, there's a, on the Challenger project, there's a little piece uh, done by um, uh, Nick in LA about how to, how to apply it to your, your brand and take it forward. So um, finally, the third part of this, because uh, as you can see, I'm very interested in it and its implications, and we're still very much kind of playing with it and exploring it, is the bigger question really, which is, so how do I apply all this to a legacy brand? I understand legacy brands might want to take more of a challenger mindset, but I also understand how difficult that is because we work with them and it's hard. Uh, so what have you learned from 20 years, Adam, of doing this uh, for a living and still somehow being in business that I can kind of take home and apply myself? Well, the first thing I, I guess I just to note is this fantastic um, word that the FT invented uh, called incumbation. And incumbation uh, is a word that characterizes what it means to deliberately and willfully sit down here, really, and kind of ignore the fact that all this stuff is happening. Um, so the opposite of what we're talking about is incumbation. And at some level, um, I think part of our first job as strategists is to describe and quantify compellingly the danger of incumbation to our clients. So this much I know from the last 20 years. The first is, as Vicky was saying, challenger is a mindset rather than a state of market. And when I talk to clients about taking a challenger mindset, the way I tend to frame it is, look, um, challenger for us can be in front of the curtain or behind the curtain. That's to say we can choose to talk about ourselves as a challenger to the outside world, or we can keep this behind the curtain and just make it a useful framework for this moment in our lives. That's entirely your choice. But at least for this moment in our lives, I suggest it's going to be useful to take a challenger mindset. And that's going to mean that effectively we challenge things, not only about the market, but about ourselves. We challenge assumptions about why we're doing the things that we're doing and gives us permission to involve other people in that conversation as well. So making that um, shift, that clarity that it's a mindset, and you don't necessarily have to commit externally to calling yourself a challenger. 
is an important step, psychological safety. Many of them do, but actually it needs to be their decision, not your decision. Um, it can be just as powerful for legacy brands. That's how we make our money. It helps enormously if they have challenger DNA somewhere in their past. So pointing out that they've had it is not foreign to them. You're just trying to revitalize it uh, is useful if you've got it. So do some digging and help them understand it. Most of them have forgotten that and can't see it anymore. And then there's some preconditions for success. So we tend to think of our job as, understandably, we're strategists, we work on strategy. My experience in working with legacy brands is this, it's what happens either side of the strategy that is least as important, if not more important. So the first is what happens before you actually arrive at or do the strategy journey with them, and secondly, what happens afterwards. Let me talk about briefly about both those two things. So before the strategy, um, you need to have a client who is prepared to have a go. They don't need to be a challenger, but in terms of their character, you need to kind of really look them in the eye and say, is this right for you as an individual? Regardless of your talent or your expertise or how good you would be at doing it, are you really prepared to at least explore this? Because there are plenty of individuals for whom it's not right for. Either it's not right for this stage in their life, I frankly, I just can't risk getting fired at this point, I'm paying for my kids to go to school, I don't want to move, or actually it's just not me. So you have to identify whether the client is the right type of client to actually propose this to, very obvious. The second is you've got to create the case for change, and you've got to create the case for change in a way that um, they can take up and out to create senior sponsorship for themselves, and they can bind a group outside marketing to them and create a cross-functional, cross-disciplinary team that marches with them through this kind of development of the strategy and application of the strategy. Um, so, for instance, uh, hang on a second, I'm missing a chart here. Here we go. Um, so this is a chart that's actually not, not ours at all. It was um, created by a, a friend uh, at IKEA. And like all IKEA things, it's kind of wonderfully simple. What it says is there are four factors for success, you know, if you are trying to work and apply this to a legacy brand or create any kind of change. You need to create a case for change, and that needs to be accepted. Uh, you then need to create a shared vision. So this is less about you presenting something to them and them feeling that they own it and they've arrived at it themselves. Uh, you th they then need to have the capacity for change and finally need a realistic plan. And what's nice about this chart, of course, is it looks at what happens if you take away any one of those factors from the success model. And you can read it. I don't need to describe it to you. But um, the point I'd make about this is that I, I've learned this the hard way. For the first probably 10 years of Eat Big Fish, I uh, didn't really bother to do this at all. Boy, did that bite us in the bum. I spend a huge amount of time doing this these days. And these are with clients who've approached us because they say they want to be challengers. I'm not trying to persuade them to be challengers because they don't want to be challengers. They said they want to be challengers, but constructing that case with them and for them. Spend a lot of time on. The second biggest mistake I see is that actually once people think once you've made that case once, you don't have to make it again. Entirely untrue. That lives and stays bonded to the strategy for the next 18 months. You go on making that case for change and people are bored to, till are bored to tears with it because that's the thing that's going to get them to change what they're doing and behave in a different way. Um, okay, uh, yes, so uh, I've talked about this. Yes, yeah, so character is more important than talent. Uh, I had a wonderful client um, at Virgin, Chris Moss, uh, who used to say, what you need, Adam, uh, in your clients is people who take the word no as a request for further information. Um, and there is a real sense of that. I mean, it's quite good criteria you want to evaluate in terms of, because you'll get, you'll get no a lot, right? You do get no a lot. So you need somebody who's going to say, that's fine. Let me just tell you a bit more about the case for change or why this is the right thing to do or what our customers really thought about that. Um, create the case for change I've talked about. Help them enlist support. So they're not going to do this on their own. Help them achieve psychological safety. How they achieve psychological safety is by enlisting the key other disciplines that are important to them and hunt effectively as a pack cross-functionally. And I suggest that is part of our job, not necessarily your job as a strategist, but the agency's job, the people around you to help create that supportive environment. Because it's a really lonely, isolating thing trying to be a client as a challenger in a, in a business you're not sure wants it. Uh, I remember quite a searing conversation um, 
actually with a PlayStation client. We worked on the launch of PlayStation 4 a few years ago in the US. And we thought they were right up for it. There had been a challenger once. They'd got the challenger DNA uh, in their roots. God knows they needed to take on Xbox and do something special again, and they did. Fantastic client, very strong client, very confident, never projected any uncertainty. Over dinner a year later, she said, you have no idea how exposed I was. And I thought, okay, you're right, I didn't. And actually part of my job is to make sure you're not, or suddenly you don't feel that exposed in that kind of situation. Help them to enlist support. Make, the, make sure they feel this is we doing this rather than I doing this. Make sure that case for change travels with them. And actually the other thing we found increasingly is that um, strategy and ideas need to travel together. Why? Because a lot of the people that you are taking with you will not be conceptual thinkers. They're going to need an illustrative idea that brings to life what the implications of that strategy are so they can understand it. That's fine. That's the way that they see the world. That's the way that they think. Um, so that's before the strategy. And then just after the strategy, I think to recognize um, you will have that difficult first year or first, possibly first difficult 18 months. You'll announce what the strategy is. The organization will be rather quizzical unless it's absolutely desperate, but most of us are not with clients in that situation. It's absolutely desperate, things become much easier. But if you're trying to push a legacy brand to think more like a challenger, behave more like a challenger, you're going to get a lot of kind of crossed arms and quizzical looks for that first year. And so recognizing that's going to come, keeping that group together, hunting as a pack, keeping that client confident, um, creating a, a kind of mandate and authority, and finding your confidence, either by doing it gradually, um, as uh, Tillamook did, or indeed by just becoming so immersed in understanding your customer and so confident in playing back what the customer actually thinks about what you're doing that you overcome, if you like, any internal misgivings. Um, and creating organizational patience. Patience, organizational patience is the most precious commodity in the world and the scarcest commodity in the world. Part of our job as strategists, perhaps, is to help our clients create that, not to do it all ourselves. And again, we're not the only people in the agency but from an agency point of view, to create that organizational patience, to give it the chance to succeed. Most challenger strategies, most challenger executions are not their best first out the blocks. They don't get the uh, evidence you need straight out the blocks. To some degree, you need to sometimes double down that after you've got the first round of data or results in. That requires a degree of perseverance and resilience that you need to nurture, we need to nurture and help our clients have. So, um, you can apply challenger thinking to legacy brands. It is incredibly powerful when it does. You don't need a charismatic owner driver, but you do need senior support, and you do need a cross-functional team. And you do need to think about what's either side of the strategy as you go. And then finally, as you do it, I think giving, as I say, license to kind of play a bit and explore in a safe space and make it fun and see what uh, different kinds of, strategy, kinds of challenger strategy would do for you and take you to, um, I think that can be quite powerful. So this is my cunning summary of what I've talked about. Brilliant, that's all you need, really. Um, what I was going to do was suggest that actually, why don't we have some Q&A now? So what I'd like you to do is turn to your neighbor um, and talk to your neighbor about what you found potentially interesting or useful in the last 45 minutes. And then secondly, a question you might have for me. So let's just spend five minutes discussing it with your neighbor, and then we'll take some questions. I think Vicky will moderate some questions or some observations from the room. OK, thank you. Okay, we're going to start again. <laughs> we're going to start again. Um. We've, got about, we've got about 10 minutes for questions, um, although I'm going to slightly cheekily nip in up front and then we'll open it to the floor. Because um, I did have one question that I was, really wanted to ask Adam, which is, it seems to me that um, this could all uh, fall at the first if we don't make a good case for change. Um, so I was just wondering, Adam, if there were a couple of hints and tips that you could give us in terms of what makes a good case for change. So my experience is that the very senior figures in an organization uh, are not really future facing. Uh, the way they're making the decisions is based on how the company made its money last year. Uh, and that what you need to do is show them what's going to happen in five years time if we go on pursuing the current model. Uh, clearly, you've got to quantify that in some way if you can. Um, so in the past, for instance, when we've worked with a big uh, hotel, international hotel chain, we looked at you know, the fact that nobody under the age of 40 thought about them uh, or was interested in staying in them. And if you allowed that to persist over a five to 10 year period, you weren't going to get anybody, any franchisee who wanted to buy your brand franchise in five or 10 years time because there were much more interesting sexy models underneath. 
the second thing actually relating to that one too is my experience is nobody tells bad news to really senior figures, so they just don't know. <laughs> so in that particular case, we set up uh, a, uh, something called Pulse, which was a direct interface between the executive team and um, consumers under 40 all over, the, all over the world, where they could ask them questions and get direct unfiltered feedback, which is a bit of a gamble, but you kind of assume that they'd all say, mm, you know, um, I don't really stay in your place. It's not my kind of place, to be honest. It's a bit dull. You know, you'd get some direct feedback. Very good as a little jolt of energy about, hmm, this isn't quite looking what I thought it was looking like. Tell me more. So getting that kind of openness. Um, and the third, obviously, I think is, is developing some genuine customer stroke consumer mandate for it. It's, it's fairly obvious, but I, I think if you kind of look to the future and you take a five-year period and start to quantify the, uh, what the trajectory looks like and doesn't look like, um, that's usually a good place to start. Brilliant. Thank you, Adam. Um, so I'll open it to the floor. Who would, who's got a question? Oh, first hand up. We've got a mic just coming to you. Hello. Um, how do you prevent any of the brands that you're working with changing from having a challenger mindset to then going back and becoming an incumbent mindset? Yeah, so it's a really good question. Um, one of the big, biggest difficulties for any of us, I think, is, the, is client churn. Yeah. So you work on a deep uh, problem for a client that requires a lot of focus and attention and some consistency. Uh, you work with a team, they're very committed to it. Eight months after you come up with a conclusion, HR replaces them and sends them off to Bogota and gets somebody else in. The new person in wants to professionalize this business a bit and add some value. And the value they're adding is usually of an incumbent type of value rather than a challenger kind of value. So one of the reasons to have um, as a strategist is to have a group of clients a kind of aligning around this rather than one, is it makes it much harder for a single individual to then add value in an unhelpful kind of way. So I, I think if you can and then if you can reconvene that group and keep them drinking from the same well and maintain the case for change, uh, that's important. The third factor, I think, is um, really um, almost overemphasizing the internal marketing of sec early success factors and green shoots and how you're doing. If you talk to any of these challenges or people in legacy brands who have a three-year period of create a significant difference by taking a challenger mindset, and you ask them, in retrospect, what two things would you have done differently? They always say the same thing. The first is, I wish I hadn't pissed so many people off. And then there's a beat, and they say, but I don't think I could have done it any other way. And the second thing they said is, I would have tripled the amount of internal marketing that I did. I would have just shared the word on how we were doing and the progress we were making and how people would be responding three times as much as I did. So when, for instance, we um, applied that understanding finally to we were working with Charles Schwab in the States to getting them to rediscover their challenger mojo, the CMO did a brilliant thing. He actually said, well, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to recruit a kind of shadow of me who's going to be the internal CMO. So all this person is going to do is be the internal brand evangelist for everything that we're doing, work with the four different business divisions, share how well it's going, all that kind of stuff, because that's how we're going to keep the momentum up. And over a four or five year time period, they completely transformed their business. But it was understanding we need to systemically address that need for internal communication that was key. So it's identifying your stakeholders and then managing yeah, them. Yeah, absolutely right. And then <laughs> just, and, and again, don't uh, overestimate how much attention they're paying to you. Mm because they're not. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, you said earlier in the presentation that um, this really needs to be packaged for people to get sponsorship up and throughout the organization. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, um, it, you know, it is, it is really about saying, look, um, where are we on that? You know, little grid, you know, uh, we are probably kind of down here. We're not, are we really progressing the category? So basically, let's, let's fill in that grid first, right? Step one, fill in that. Where are we on this grid? Are we really progressing the category? Are we really progressing the brand? No, not so much. Is there anybody else in this category who is? Yes, there is. Are they growing as a result of it? Are they growing in consumer retention as a result of it? What's happening to our, our perceived imagery in consumers' minds? Well, they're taking a bit of share, but boy, is our kind of, you know, brand positioning kind of being affected by that. Should we do something about it if you project that over five years? Yes, we probably should. So it's a kind of a journey you go through. All right, let's try and quantify that. So what's the case for change? If we don't do anything and that goes on happening, what's going to happen to us? So you can just go down. All right, so what might our response be? Let's look at you know, what 
four out of ten proven challenger narratives. Let's apply them to ourselves. So I think it's a very simple kind of journey that you lead people through, which is different from saying, come on, let's take a challenger approach to this and see what happens. You need to lead them. It's the psychological safety point, I think. And clearly, some clients are much more gung-ho and say, don't give me all that shit, just get to the good stuff. And some people say, no, this is great. Can we just spend a bit more time talking about this? Because I'm not quite sure about it. Depends on who the client and the organization is. Back to um, creating the case for change, perhaps with a complacent client. Um, you described my client perfectly. Um, do you think there is still a benefit for adopting a challenger mindset if you are technically approaching monopoly status? Um, <laughs> I, one of the most interesting projects I had was working on what was then SAB Miller in South Africa that was kind of a monopoly. So they had a 93% share of the South African beer market. A uh, joint venture between Diageo and Heineken uh, came in, uh, entered the market. Their share plummeted from 93% to 91%. Um, <laughs> and so they said, well, look, uh, Adam, you know, have you ever worked with, with kind of incumbents trying to defend themselves against um, you know, newcomers? And I, I guess I would say that um, one of the truths of the modern world is that uh, being a challenger is a mindset rather than a state of market. And because of that issue of velocity and because that issue of... And that velocity comes also, of course, with the way that public opinion can turn against you. Look at Uber, for instance. Um, those things can happen really fast. And that unless you are adopting a challenger mindset, I think the ability to kind of genuinely keep on seeing how you're progressing the category and therefore staying ahead of challenges and staying on the right side of the public conversation, I think that's damaged and compromised. So I would say that, wouldn't I? But, you know, do you disagree? No, not at all. That's a really good way of thinking about it. And actually, Fantastic. because they are approaching that not 91%, there is definitely a lot of sentiment. It's the brand that people love to hate, particularly at their trade end. Um, so yes, thinking about public opinion, I think, is a really nice point of jeopardy that I can take away. Yeah, I mean, we worked with a, with a big tech company a couple of years ago, and their observation was, because they had a dominant position, was they like it, but they don't like us. And that's a dangerous position to be in um, because that can change really fast. So that's your mandate for having more of a challenging mindset, I guess, in that situation. I think we've got time for one more question. Oh, yes, there's somebody just there. Um, if you have worked on a legacy brand which has been perceived as one that is of value um, and a challenger comes in and pretty much undercuts that brand, and so the, the needle has shifted now on the perception of what value is for a lot of consumers, do you then have a conversation with your clients and say, let's fight fire with fire and we have to refresh what our perception or what our um, proposition of value is? Or do you potentially look at the, the different uh, narrative model that exists and go, well, where can we potentially sit so we're not having to fight fire with fire and we've got a different space to play in? Um, so, I, listen, I think there are two ways you can go. So one is to say... Um, if what we've been offering up to now is purely value, then that has to change because ultimately if, if they're going to constantly undercut us, we have to offer a more emotional relationship where value, of course, is a part of our message but not the only part of our message. And I think some of those bigger narratives that I've talked about could be about that, right? Because democratizer is about a very emotional message but it has value at its heart. Um, so I think you can go that way. Um, I think that uh, you, you could theoretically, I suppose, try and move away from value altogether, though I can imagine that might be difficult. Um, there are, I think, in interesting case studies, obviously, that we all know, uh, where um, brands, by doing um, a different kind of narrative, a much more emotional brand-based positioning, have simply transcended the whole question of value altogether. They maintain a reputation of value, even though they aren't the cheapest. So I, I think there are different ways you can go. But I, I, th I personally, what I would do is, I'd start saying, how do we wrap a narrative around our version of value? that makes it different enough, A, for people not to compare too much, but B, to give them a different emotional benefit other than the price alone. I think that would be a good place to start. 